Thank you for joining us for Belmont's Future, a town of homes for all. I'm Rachel Heller, and this is Betsy Lipson. We're co-chairs of Belmont's Housing Trust. The Housing Trust is a town committee whose purpose is to ensure opportunities for people with low, moderate, and middle incomes to have housing that they can afford in our community. Our presentation is intended to provide you with information about affordable housing strategies and tools that Belmont can use to ensure that we are a town of homes for all. In this presentation, we will address the following questions. Is housing affordability an issue in Belmont? What is affordable housing? What is 40B? What is inclusionary zoning? What is a housing production plan? And what's happening with housing development at McLean? We all know that home prices are high. In fact, here in Belmont, we typically see rents for a two bedroom home at $2,500 per month and homes being sold for $950,000 to a million dollars. And the reality is that people's incomes are simply not keeping pace with the cost of housing. In fact, we know from the Housing Trust research that 29% of homeowners and 44% of renters are considered housing cost burdened. This means that they are spending more than 30% of their incomes on housing. Spending 30% of one's income on housing is considered the standard for affordability. These figures are pre-pandemic. We know that many people are facing housing burdens right now as unemployment has risen and enhanced federal unemployment benefits have ended. When people hear the term affordable housing, many wonder what that means. The Massachusetts Affordable Housing Law, Chapter 40B, defines affordable at or below 80% of the area median income. This means for a one person household, a person earning $67,000 per year would be eligible for affordable housing. For a four person household, a family could earn $96,000 a year and be uh, eligible for affordable housing. While these incomes may seem high, the reality is that a household needs to earn $115,000 a year to afford renting a three bedroom home here in Belmont, where a median income is about $120,000. This is all according to data from the National Low Income Housing Coalition and their annual out of reach report which analyzes incomes needed to support housing costs in every state and region. Based on this analysis, we know that about one in four households here in Belmont are eligible for affordable housing. We know that many people in town are earning less than 80% of the area median income. And you'll see affordable housing in town that's affordable to different income brackets. You might see something that's affordable to a household at 60%, or 50% or 30% of the area median income. This serves households with lower incomes. For instance, the proposal for new development at the McLean property includes homes that are market rate. It includes homes that are affordable to households who are at 80% of the area median income. And it includes some options for people who are at 50% of the area median income. This means that there will be some opportunities for people earning between $44,000 and $63,000, depending on their household size. Creating housing opportunity for people at different income levels requires different tools. One form of affordable housing is called naturally occurring affordable housing. These are the homes around town that have rents that are at affordable levels, and these are set by the owners. They are not considered affordable by the state's definition because the rent levels are determined by the owners and can change at any time. They may also not be inhabited by people who would be eligible for affordable housing. Our town and state track deed restricted affordable housing because these homes come with long term affordability requirements with rents and rules that are set by local, state and or federal policies. 
There are many ways this long-term affordable housing is created, and we've used many of these tools here in Belmont. 40B refers to our state's affordable housing law. This tool provides a mechanism for developing housing that serves people across income levels. 20 to 25% of homes in a 40B development are affordable. The market rate homes support the affordable homes and the affordable homes are needed to allow those market rate homes to be built. The combination of market rate and affordable homes make it possible to build and operate 40B developments. Inclusionary zoning like 40B includes a mix of market rate and affordable homes. Our town has an inclusionary zoning policy that ensures when private developments of six or more homes are being built, that a percentage are set aside as affordable. There is no financial assistance provided on behalf of the town. The reason why the affordability requirement kicks in at six homes and the percentage increases based on how many homes are being built is that that's to make the numbers work for the long term um, and that the market rates, market rate rents and affordable rents work together to cover both the development and the operating costs. 40B and inclusionary zoning are zoning tools that facilitate mixed income housing. We also have state and federal programs that provide funding for more deeply affordable housing. This subsidized housing comes in many forms, including housing choice vouchers, which you may know as Section 8, or the Massachusetts Rental Voucher Program, also called MRVP. It also comes in the form of low-income housing tax credits, which is a public-private partnership used to develop mixed-income communities, and public housing. Public housing is owned by public housing authorities and subsidized by the state or federal government, depending on how it was created. With programs like Section 8, MRVP, public housing, and other rental subsidy programs, tenants pay no more than 30 to 40% of their income towards rent. If their incomes drop, as may be the case uh, because of the pandemic and unemployment rising, their rent adjusts so that they can continue to afford to live there. In other affordable housing, that's not the case. The rents are set at affordable levels and are not adjusted based on a household's change in income. Here in Massachusetts, we have a state law called Chapter 40B. Chapter 40B was passed in 1969 to address exclusionary zoning and to ensure that all communities are allowing affordable homes to be built. This policy was passed a year after the Fair Housing Act was passed federally. The Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination concerning the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on race, religion, national origin, sex, disability, and family status. These laws are critical tools to addressing segregation that was intentionally created through housing laws such as redlining. Chapter 40B requires communities to have at least 10% of their housing set aside as affordable to households at or below 80% of the area median income. Developments can be counted towards the 10% benchmark if 20 to 25% of the homes are affordable. Because the state has such a great need for rental housing, both market rate and affordable, 100% of the homes built in a 40B rental development are counted. In the case of the Royal Belmont, all 298 homes are counted by the state. 60 of the apartments are affordable to households below 50% of the area median income. If a town is below the 10% benchmark set by the law, Developers may work through the 40B process to have a comprehensive permit issued by the town, and they may appeal to the state if the town denies the permit or puts requirements on the proposal that make the development unfeasible. It's important to note that getting to 10% provides communities with even more control over how we add more affordable opportunities in Belmont. Here in Belmont, we are making progress. In just a few years, we've added hundreds of affordable homes to the state's subsidized housing inventory. This is the tool that the state uses to track the progress of communities in reaching the 10% benchmark. When it was last calculated, we had 10,117 homes in Belmont. 
that sets our benchmark at 1,012 affordable homes that are needed. After the Royal Belmont and the Bradford and Cushing Square are counted, we have an affordable stock of 675 homes. That leaves 337 homes that we need to provide to get to the state's 10% benchmark. Belmont recently adopted a housing production plan. Our housing production plan identifies housing needs, strategies for increasing the number of affordable homes in town, and areas of town that would be particularly good for development, such as along transit or in walkable neighborhoods near commercial centers or on underutilized sites. Our housing production plan is important because it provides information and strategies for making progress. And if we make progress by adding affordable homes, Belmont achieves a safe harbor status with the state. Safe harbor status gives Belmont a one to two year period, depending on how many affordable homes we add, where we could deny a proposal through the 40B process. Belmont has a housing production plan in place, but would need to add 50 to 100 new affordable homes to achieve a safe harbor status. Belmont has a path forward for expanding affordable housing opportunities in town. Approving the housing production plan was a really important step. Since then, town meeting also approved strengthening our inclusionary zoning policy so that more affordable homes will be built anytime private development of more than six homes is being developed here in town. To get a sense of what our strength in policy does, we can take a look at the Bradford in Cushing Square. This new development will have 12 much needed affordable homes. Had our strengthened inclusionary zoning policy been in place when the Bradford was being proposed and developed um, before town, the development would have included 18 affordable homes. Town meeting members have a new opportunity at the September town meeting to make significant progress in expanding housing opportunities in town and adding more homes towards the 10% benchmark by approving a zoning change for development on the McLean property. Over the next few months, it is important to build local support and take additional actions like dedicating Community Preservation Act funds for affordable housing development, adopting zoning for multifamily housing, engaging the community and re-energizing Waverly Square, and focusing on development that contributes to vibrant, walkable neighborhoods. These actions are critical for addressing two of the great challenges of our lifetimes, the pandemic and racial equity. Coronavirus has demonstrated the importance of safe, stable, affordable housing. When people have homes they can afford, they can socially distance or quarantine, protecting themselves, their families, and our communities. Creating new housing opportunities is key to advancing racial equity. Black and brown people have been intentionally kept out of communities like ours in the past by redlining, exclusionary zoning, and other discriminatory housing policies. We must put in place intentional policies to undo the discriminatory policies that have shaped so much of our country and so much of our state. And yet that change depends on us, most of whom do not see the barriers and do not know what it is like to have the police called on us simply for walking down the street or going for a jog. Until we put in place policies that allow for new housing opportunities for people across income levels, our housing and zoning decisions continue to perpetuate segregation, limiting opportunities for people and keeping people out. With the Black Lives Matter movement calling for change, this is an opportunity to collectively recognize the role that zoning and access to housing play in systemic racism. As noted in the previous slide, we have an opportunity to make a zoning change that would create 150 new housing opportunities in Belmont. The proposal for housing at McLean will allow Belmont to meet multiple housing needs facing our community and add 116 homes towards our 10% benchmark. This would help Belmont achieve a safe harbor status with the state and add 40 age-restricted townhomes for purchase as well as 110 rental homes 
with 53 of the apartments set aside for seniors and 57 apartments without age restrictions. If approved, development will include six affordable home ownership opportunities, as well as 28 affordable rentals, with six of the apartments being affordable to people with lower incomes. Saying yes to development at McLean and to more housing opportunities in town strengthens our community. By creating downsizing options for seniors, affordable opportunities for people across income levels, and more accessible housing, we are allowing homes and creating opportunities for people who want to live here rather than keeping people out. Adding housing opportunities that are diverse in style, such as multifamily housing or homes that are in walkable neighborhoods, long transit, this allows us to meet the needs of our neighbors who struggle to afford high housing costs. It supports our local businesses and it fosters an inclusive environment. Affordable housing really does benefit all of us. I've talked about many reasons why we think adding housing opportunities in Belmont is important and beneficial to our community. Now we're going to hear from people who live in some of these new housing opportunities. First, Betsy will read a statement from Barbara Miranda, a resident of the Royal Belmont. Then we'll have a conversation with Charlene O'Connor, who also lives in the Royal. Great, so we are gonna hear from two people actually, and uh, one of them couldn't make it, but she kindly um, wrote up remarks that I'm gonna read from her. So this is from Barbara Miranda, who um, is a longtime Belmont resident. And here's what she had to say. By way of introduction, I'm a past board member and chair of the Belmont Council on Aging and past chief of staff for Belmont State Senator. Over those years, I worked with many Belmont folks to help solve housing problems they were having. But I'm here to tell you our more personal story. We had lived for 39 years in a large Victorian house in Belmont and we're sort of idly planning to just stay there in that great neighborhood. But two years ago, a huge tree fell on the house and insurance covered a long list of major repairs, new roof, new porch, new chimney, and repair and painting of the ceilings and walls in three bedrooms. At the time, we were both retired and in our 80s. We had some assets, but our monthly social security and pensions were not covering our expenses taxes, water bills, and most everything was getting more expensive and our income was fixed. One day we looked at each other and said, why are we sitting on hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity in this house and at the same time worrying about increased expenses? And that day we decided to sell. Our children thought that was fine. They all have houses of their own. We wanted to stay in Belmont, and so we quickly rented an apartment at the Royal Belmont after one visit. This is not senior housing, nor is it dedicated to any particular income level, but for us it provides a sort of assisted living light. I'm 10 years younger than I was two years ago. Garage underneath, trash chute down the hall, elevator, no yard work, the staff is efficient, kind, and helpful. Ceiling light bulb burns out, maintenance comes immediately to replace it. No hot water, same, and no snow shoveling. We enjoy the diversity of the residents here. Many are from other countries, perhaps graduate students or working in high tech. There is a paved walking path with bollards along Acorn Park Driveway to Discovery Park and Alewife Station. There's a swimming pool and fitness room, as well as a business center. People say to me, but it's so expensive. That is so, but we no longer have to pay real estate taxes, water bills, homeowners insurance, and for painting the house and other major expenses. I realize our choice is available mostly to people who have accrued substantial equity in, uh, in a house. I've not always been a fan of luxury apartment development though. Towns like Belmont need diversity in housing and actual low income apartments for every age group, cooperative houses, in-law apartments, shared living arrangements, accommodations for non-traditional families. Mainly, I want to encourage people our age to think about easing the burden, making life more pleasant and enjoying whatever amenities you can capture. Barbara Miranda. Thank you, Barbara. And we also have with us Charlene O'Connor, 
And Charlene has been a resident of Belmont for 33 years. We brought her on because she uh, recently went through similar processes, Barbara, of um, moving out of her home and finding another place to live. Charlene, why did you move to the Royal Belmont? My story sounds a lot like Barbara's. The house was empty. It was an empty nester. I found it difficult to take care of it. I was living in a one family and um, I wanted to downsize. But the one thing I knew I didn't want to do was to move into that development that had occurred on the property we were trying to protect. So it took me a long time to come over here, even though I had difficulties finding an apartment in January, uh, February, March of 2018. So I finally did come over, and as soon as I walked in, I loved it. The first thing that hit me were all of the foreign languages and the accents and the diversity of the people and children and dogs. And like Barbara said, you could feel 10 years younger, and it, you had the amenities of being in some sort of a senior place, but it isn't. And I've been able to meet a lot of young people. They're looking to make new friends. And they've even made friends with me and Barbara, I'm, I'm sure, also. Great. It's fascinating. When you were looking before you found the Royal, what sort of opportunities did you find in Belmont? Well, I know that years ago there were more apartments. And a lot of those are condos now. So, I did find some beautiful apartments in um, really nice older homes, but I realized that it would still be a matter of my going into the basement to do laundry. Uh, maybe there would be no air conditioning, central air conditioning, which I had never had, but I was aging and decided I needed it and uh, also parking spaces for when my children came to visit. Maybe I would be offered one parking space overnight. Can you talk a little bit about um, housing development that occurred while you were living in Belmont and what was your feeling about um, developments that were being proposed? Well, it was mainly this one. It was mainly this one that was very upsetting. And as a matter of fact, I remember once I decided to move in, I was a little embarrassed. And I got permission from some of my friends after the fact. Please don't give up on me, but I really would like to live there. Do you think Belmont should develop more opportunities for people to stay in town and for others to move here? Definitely. However we can. Because one of the things I also like about this is that I know that there are 60 apartments that are affordable. I don't know who lives in them, but I like that fact as well. And when I sold my house, I was surprised at how much the value had gone up. And I realized that it's, it's going to be wealthier people more and more who are going to be able to move into Belmont otherwise. Yeah. And when I moved in here, I was a teacher. And that's, that's not a lot of money. And I could afford to buy a house here. I don't think that would happen now. One income public school teacher. Right, right. Well, that's the that's great insight. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks, Charlene. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, thank you. Thank you for doing this work. Rachel, that was a great presentation, thank you. Um, over the years of working on the Housing Trust in Belmont, doing a number of presentations, we have received many questions and I would say that there are a few that rise to the top as the most common. So if you don't mind, I'm just gonna ask them here and I'd love to hear you respond so people have an opportunity to, um, to hear um, how the Housing Trust um, responds to the community when these come up. Um, so first, I'm going to ask you a few questions about 40B. Uh, if the purpose of 40B is to increase affordable housing, why are rents for the affordable units still so high? For example, 
a two bedroom at 80% AMI might rent right now for about $2,000. That doesn't seem affordable. Okay, so the rents in 40B developments are based on someone paying 30% of their income towards their housing costs. Um, so if you remember earlier in the presentation, we talked about a four person household could have a salary of $96,000. So for a household with $96,000 in income, the rents are then based on their paying 30% of that towards housing. Okay, great. You know, a, a, a related question is that most of the units in a 40B, like at the Royal Belmont, for example, are considered by many to be quite expensive. Why are these expensive units in a 40B development uh, counted towards Belmont's 10% on the subsidized housing inventory? So Massachusetts has a huge need for more housing. In fact, our regional planning agency says that we need 400,000 more homes added to our stock by the year 2040 just to meet the needs of our economy. Um, so ensuring that people who are retiring and staying put have a place to live as well as people who are moving into those jobs and, and people who are already living here. Um, in fact, one of the reasons why housing costs are so high in Massachusetts is because we simply don't have enough homes for our needs. And so by allowing 100% um, to count on the subsidized housing inventory when you're mixing together market rate and affordable, it's really for the purpose of ensuring that we are adding to that need. We, we are meeting that need. Uh, we have a particular need for rental housing, and that is the reason why 100% of rental developments are counted. But when we're talking about 40Bs that are home ownership, it's only the affordable homeownership opportunities that are counted. Rachel, we also hear from people who are interested in understanding 40Bs, um, why the developments don't have affordable units at a deeper level of affordability for households who earn less um, than the area median income or less than 80% of the area median income. It's expensive to build and operate housing here in Massachusetts. And if additional subsidies are not being required by the town, the state or the federal government and a developer is building uh, a mix of affordable and market without the, the financial assistance, it, you really need both. You need the market rate to support the affordable. Um, and it's really the affordable and the market rate together that make the development possible, possible to be developed and possible to be operated over the long term. And what would it take for us to support more housing developments that provide units for people who are at the 30% uh, area median income? I think you mentioned low income housing tax credit developments, for example. The low income housing tax credit program um, actually serves households that are lower than 80% of area median income, but also above 30% of area median income. So it hits the spot of serving households who are actually at 60% of the area median income. When we want to do deeper affordability, it's critical to have more rental assistance. And our rental assistance programs are funded at the state and federal levels. And it's important that we ask our state legislature and our federal government to increase funding for programs like Section 8, programs like the Massachusetts Rental Voucher Program, and also to support the funding for public housing, because public housing is also serving households largely uh, below 30% of the area median income. So 40B has been around since 1969, and what has been the impact of it? It has been an incredibly effective law. Uh, 40B has created more than 70,000 homes in the state and is the way that multifamily housing is developed outside of our cities. And this is largely because many communities like ours zone for single family homes. And in order to get the multifamily housing that we so greatly need, 40B has become the way 
to do that. Um, now, communities can uh, take advantage of other planning tools and allow for multifamily housing in the areas where that community thinks it's appropriate. Um, until communities take those steps and allow for that development, that's when 40B is really at, at, at most effective and ensuring that housing development is happening and people have opportunities to live in the communities that have not yet figured out how to create that, that opening for the kind of housing that we so greatly need. Rachel, oftentimes 40B developments are considered controversial when they're proposed. Are they always controversial? No, 40B, develop, 40B is actually a tool and communities often use it to get the kind of development that they want. Uh, for instance, the proposal at McLean is considered a friendly 40B. The town has worked with the developer to come up with a proposal for zoning that will allow the development to really meet the needs that Belmont has. Um, however, it didn't start out that way either. When the development was first proposed, it didn't meet a lot of the needs that, that we have here in town. But through the 40B process and through the planning process and working with the developer, it has really turned into something that meets multiple needs here in our community. I have two questions for you that we hear um, often again, and these are, the, these are the common reasons that residents don't support new housing developments. They generally um, talk about issues with traffic and issues with school. So why should Belmont residents support new housing since many people feel traffic is already a concern? Traffic is intense in town, <laughs> I agree. Um, however, by limiting opportunities here in Belmont and other communities that are in this area, the result is that people are being pushed to live further and farther away from where they work. The result is that we have a lot more people coming through our town rather than living in our town and being able to possibly take the commuter rail, the bus, or driving a shorter distance to get to one of the job centers that we're, we're near. I think it's also important on the traffic side to think about our climate goals and to know that we do want to make it easier for people to get around without using their cars. And if we are building housing near transit in walkable neighborhoods, then we're really accomplishing multiple goals. We are creating affordable opportunities. We are supporting our local businesses by having more foot traffic, more people walking around. And we are able to also do the kind of growth that reduces our impact on climate change. If we're allowing a lot more sprawl, then we're going to be using more resources. People are gonna be driving further and we're going to be exacerbating climate change. With regards to schools, it's important to note that the fair housing laws in place in our country and here in our state actually prohibit us from making decisions about housing based on who would live there. Um, so family status or families with children are actually a protected class. And we can't make decisions about allowing a housing development based on our worries about our school, school costs, overcrowding. In addition, um, even if we could make those decisions and we could have um, a way to um, limit the impact of development on our schools, um, our regional planning agency has found that there's actually not any correlation between the amount of housing that a community may allow and school enrollment. Um, so we see in Massachusetts that there's a handful of communities that have a growth in the school age population. And those are communities that have particularly desirable schools or are particularly affordable. Um, and so Belmont is a place where people do wanna move and, and the schools are great. Um, whether or not we build more housing, people will come to town. They will find ways to move in here. Um, and and, um, and you, know, the, you, can't really, you can't really limit um, how many kids are coming into our community. Um, I think also it's important to note with that is um, it's about our values. Uh, if we are not creating opportunities for people with low and moderate incomes to live here, then what we'll see are as we're allowing downsizing opportunities, the families that will move into the homes that seniors have vacated will be families with more wealth. 
And so we want to make sure, at least I want to make sure, and I think more people in town want to make sure that we're creating opportunities for people who can buy those single family homes and also for people with low and moderate incomes who really wouldn't have the opportunity to move here otherwise. Great. So I think to close, I'm going to ask a question for people who are listening and are interested and interested in it, um, supporting um, the housing trust in these goals. What would be something that you would recommend to a listener um, that they could do? Be a supporter for housing in our community. I think it's important to be a voice, a positive voice in our community that's talking about the positive things that development does here in Belmont. Um, by being open to the possibility of development, we can address any challenges that we might have um, concerns about in the development process. Uh, and so I think it's just important, one, to be open to the idea of new development happening here in town and then be supportive of it and talk about the good things that we'll see as a result. Absolutely. And I would encourage people to consider reaching out to their uh, local town meeting member and um, let them know that you'd like them to support the McLean zoning article uh, on this special town meeting in September. Thanks everyone. Thank you.